As we embarked on our 12th issue amid the spring of a solar eclipse, we turned our attention to the vast expanse and endless awe that is our celestial ceiling. We sojourned into soft, vacant space, illuminated with drifting cosmic light. How are we connected to ether, each other, as we witness again our midday sun become nothing more than a corona of light embracing our lunar sister? What fragments of light reach us? We wanted your whimsy spaced out dreams, your illuminations and darkness. We wanted your astrological projections and zodiac antics. We wanted your universe unveiled with an issue 12 celestial eclipse. Our contributors transport us to the beyond and back. Enjoy this release reading from a sampling of Tiny Spoon's 12th issue. A Field Guide to Lips by Aaron Robertson an erasure poem assembled from A Field Guide to the Stars and Planets by Donald H. Menzel. Lips. These interesting formations, complicated accessory equipment, the simplest, a special filter transmitting faint, difficult, white, fan-shaped streamers stretching radially outward. The best lips move directly momentarily hide the sun, both completely concealed by bright sky. Long, maximum, irregular lips are most spectacular. Sudden disappearance by day or by night terrified the ancients who did not understand. The explanation is simple. Lips move between shadow, fall on anyone cone-shaped. Completely obscured lips frequently do not reach someone directly. Under the tip of the shadow, one will see a ring of sunlight surrounding the darkened lips. A person, shadowed, taking a bite out of the sun. Lips strike the moving shadow, very small, a given. Lips are even beautiful obscured, reveal fan-shaped streamers. Lips move into shadow, not completely black. Some red rays of sunset filter through, imparting a coppery color. Though lips are rarer than earth, they are given. They are a full sphere. Mesa Verde Rapture, Annular Solar Eclipse 2023 by Aaron Robertson. Two horns grow to form haloed ring. Every open stoma serves as pinhole camera, and we walk among a million moons. Even the shadowed space between arm and trunk blooms with golden crescents. Here in the land of kivad roundness, where people climbed between worlds like ascending any other ladder. Even our teenage son is transported beyond expectation into awe. the chance to watch the sun die for a few moments. We are here to normalize feeling shadow on our souls. We have tight ropes, lassos, freeze frames, pink cookies, all needed equipment. We only request your singing voice, the strum of that guitar. This fire's flame is perpetually ignited. Ask you again 
to hold me tighter as a goddess delivers missives from the sun. She tells us she will burn up someday in years or eons. She will shine through black holes. She will make them flash lights. Lab work finds the sun is too bright, by which I mean I should not stare directly into my lymphocytes currently burning their way through cartilage. My joints are molten glass. Bones are not supposed to kiss. My doctor and I conspire to cause an eclipse when one celestial body moves into the shadow of another. The prescription is every eight weeks, moon medicine to turn down the heat. As God of the universe of my body, I allow the blood to be drawn. Then the dance of dark red shadows, 180 minutes amid the cosmos, under bright lights, in a cold room where no one is required to wear a mask. I decline the jello snack, my joints being jello enough. I lie in the eerie embrace of the blood pressure cuff, ballooning every 10 minutes to confirm that I am still alive. The curve of my elbow cradles the clock on the wall. The minutes tick as I watch the drip, drip, drip of the poison pill concocted to shroud the sun. A choir of archangels on my playlist provide necessary hope that this plan may yet orchestrate the stars in my blood to find the path of totality. For this issue of Tiny Spoon, I went back to a technique that I had a lot of fun with for issue nine, which is an experimental cut-up technique. Um, but instead of using printed out phrases uh, from pieces of paper and then cutting them up and putting them in a bowl to pull out randomly, um, instead I went digital and I created a spreadsheet. So for this project, I had two different sources of information. Um, one was a list of song lyrics, and the other was a list of phrases that I had pulled from a NASA article about the eclipse that happened um, in April of this year. And then instead of physically cutting up pieces of paper and pulling them out at random, I wrote a formula that would kind of do the same thing, choosing one phrase at random from my complete list. And I could refresh this formula repeatedly and kind of recreate the same process. So meanwhile, I found some black and white images of photographs that I had taken during the eclipse back in October of last year. And these are black and white photos I took with a manual camera. And these are images of eclipse shadows. So for this project, I picked out one of these images. And for my first poem, as I was composing the poem, I followed the shape of the shadows on the page. And then for the second poem, I used the same image, but followed the shapes of the light. The moon on earth tells me how to breathe when you're a flashlight in a dark room. Through a camera lens, you're irradiated. I'm in love, completely blocking the face of, you know, you know, for a minute there. I imagine that we both will be like a dancer, waiting for the stars to align at all times, creating a path of totality while you're almost touching me. I lost myself. I lost my 
Something of us was almost left behind, designed for solar viewing. We just walk on by. Your gaze is so cold during a total solar eclipse and quietly melts in my hand. Now, let me see you remain the shadow of the sky. A switch up on the rhythm, but the path of the eclipse continues like everything you do and shows the shadows of when you need the moon. People stop and stare, and those standing in the path even for a little while imagine that the only sky in a dark room follows the other and leaves. Dawn or dusk may see everything you do, so you and I, or a safe hand held, opens your eyes. The path of totality, the love parade, completely blocking the face of the visible surface of the minute, waiting for the stars to align until I can't see anything anymore. You say it will never be like that again, but everything burns away too quickly, and so my head, with your eyes directly solar filter secured, will instantly cause severe looking while it passes between, beneath the masks filling up an idle hour. We can't normally see, show them, tell them, for solar viewing, what to expect. Come on, come on, come on. You wanted to be one of them. It's so easy to be alone and familiar with wanting to have it all. I'd give you all and have none to see the sun cry. Hi, I'm Matt Purdy, and I'm going to read a piece that's in Tiny Spoon Issue 12. This is called The Lion in the Sky. As soon as you see it, you know what it is, the lion in the sky. It appears the instant you blink. When your eyes open, they don't need to adjust or focus. They know what to look for. They knew it would be there, the lion in the sky. You never heard anyone mention it before, and you've never read the words. Yet when you see it, you know what it is. You recognize the slope of its back and curve of its haunch like the shapes of continents. Its tail tenses and droops along its side. Its mane is a jagged corona around a face seemingly lost in meditation. You walk dazed into the street. It is something you knew could happen. But whoever thought it would? The lion in the sky. If someone asked you yesterday what it looked like, you would not have been able to say, but then nobody else could have either, and nobody would have asked. Now, in the street, you look from face to face, your neighbors, passers-by. They are all looking at the lion, but some also look at you. What did you expect them to look like? Some are afraid, some are shocked. Some look like they are ready to cry. Your lives belong to the lion now. Everything that has ever happened is now just the time before the lion in the sky appeared. It's okay to hate it. It's even okay to find it beautiful. In time, you'll figure out how to feel about it. Right now, some people are taking pictures, making videos. It's our fault, they say. We deserve this. One man picks up a rock and throws it in the direction of the lion in the sky. It just lands on the roof of someone's car. No one can tell how far away the lion is. You look to see where its shadow falls, but you can't find it anywhere. You walk away, but the lion doesn't move. It stays the same size. Perspective doesn't matter. Not for you or anyone. The lion in the sky is everywhere forever. Arrow Torch Wild tongues were our last speaking, as ghosts sparring for sensation hurt us until we cut out tongues, ghosts, touch. A magician waved his infinite wand to make us paste over every loss. Wild tongues were our last speaking. Weighed down by stars and water, we sparred without moving until we cut out tongues, stars, touch. Like captive kings and queens, we had nothing left to. Wild tongues were our last speaking. Ghosts, magicians, kings and queens possessed our implacable past until we cut out tongues, time, touch. 
Our eyes reflected the moon's death, then drifted through high windows. Wild tongues were our last speaking. We cut out tongues, ghosts, touch. Olber's Paradox Consider the persistence of stars flickering through this thin skin of gas, fixed to a whirling firmament as the world turns and journeys on its annual ellipse. Justice casts no shadow here beneath the Milky Way, is not reflected in still pools or waterfalls. The darkness swallows any earthly copy, just as though we sit in shackled rows, imprisoned underground, the fire pit behind us filled with ancient ash. Veil Nebula Where the ashes of the ancient star were scattered after its spectacular cremation, there the galaxy was made more tenuous. The weave of space itself was thinned, its normal deep-dyed denim turned to voile. And when the tides of gravity are high, the light behind the universe can just be seen. The woman wears her eyes blue and drinks her coffee bitter. She lives in a dark place of ivy secrets wrapped around her plump body. She remembers the day she was born in every detail. The blinding light, the hospital air in her lungs, and the sound of scissors carefully narrowing down her world with a snip. She never leaves any footprints behind, therefore nobody can follow her. It's a full moon tonight. Every full moon, the woman prays with one hand and measures the state of her affairs with the other. With one hand she plugs in the crucifix and listens to its holy wearing. With the other, she takes note of all things she has to do every day in order to avoid something else. Brush teeth after every meal to avoid decay. Scrub heels every morning to avoid hard skin. Apply eye cream every evening to avoid dark circles. Drink eight glasses of water to avoid sagging breasts. Eat two avocados to avoid heart disease. Stare at the ceiling for three minutes straight to avoid double chin. Do the laundry to avoid doing the shopping. Do the shopping to avoid doing the dishes. Do the dishes to avoid doing her taxes. Do the taxes to avoid jogging. Jog to avoid thinking. Think to avoid remembering. Remember to avoid forgetting. Forget to avoid aging. Age to avoid hurting. Hurt to avoid living. Live to avoid dying. And so on and so forth. Her list grows longer and longer every month. And every full moon, she can't help but see how her life has become a pile of evasions, filling up her existence with their urgent tedium. And this gives her a headache. Hi, my name is Annette Gagliardi, and I'm going to read Only an Eclipse. Each planet on its own sojourn embraces sibling planets in stellar abyss, in the vast celestial expanse of space. On Delphi, its own velvet frontier, the navel of Earth, Pythia's riddles demystify solar light, and our own illumination dances in vacancy with Luna. One shrouds the other in cosmic alignment. Sun becomes muted as Luna kisses Earth in oscillation. They merge in cosmic alignment, creating a halo of light. The glowing corona surrounds Sister Luna. The moon clings to the belly of Earth, embracing her in a gravitational dance of celestial bodies held in orbit around each other, creating pyre wrinkles that undulate and radiate, highlighted by the sun in our own celestial ceiling. The destiny of gravitational pull, kismet, 
fragments of light twinkling and glow. The spring of solar eclipse that rotates and spins connects us all, reflects in the eyes of those around me. The sun, the moon, the stars, in all celestial bodies, ponder the light in the depths of space, a supernatural magic. That's in the new edition 12 of uh, Tiny Spoon. I'm gonna read another one for you, um, and that is from my book, A Short Supply of Viability. It came out in 2022 with um, the Poetry Box. This one's called His Flowered Past. She tells me how he looked back then, she with her red hair, white skin, just a girl in love, but still aware enough to know her family would not accept his inky Italian skin, would see him as too dark. Chuckling, she tells how she powdered him with flour before introducing him. His full black hair, and she's so fair, his tall, muscular build, and the flower falling off his handsome features to his shirt front. They told her, look elsewhere, he isn't the one. But he was, he always was. The streetcar rumbled every night past her corner and he on it, just far enough away to stay out of sight in the light of the street lamp. He kissed her and she still remembers her heart racing when she and he hugged the darkness. He held that bill to the end even as the cancer wasted him, kept his muscular frame despite chemo's slow spin. His mahogany skin smoothed, faded with the ash of illness. She strokes his lush black hair, laughing. She tells the story again as she caresses his dying body, feeling his muscles still. And now I'm gonna read one more, and this one is from Proper Poems for Ladies and a few naughty ones too, and these are my aunties on the cover. This is called Leering on the Menu. You can call me waitress, miss, or even hey you. Or use my name, it's right here on my name tag, clear as day, just above these breasts you've been staring at. You don't need to call me luscious, baby, sweet cheeks, or honey bun or the little wife. I'm not your wife, nor your girlfriend. You don't even know me or anything about me. And please, take your hands off my sweet cheeks. Thank you. Hello, I'm Wendy Drexler, and I'll be reading my poem, We're Going to Need to Bring Insects If We're Ever Going to Live on Mars. And the epigraph is from an article in the New York Times, Mars Needs Insects, November 27th, 2023. Maybe by then, my mother will have forgotten the scads of grasshoppers that terrorized her all her life, haunted her every outing, crossing the sidewalk, strolling the shops at the outdoor mall, or the day she found one in her car, pulled to the curb, ran out screaming. So someday we can meet up on Mars. She, time traveling in her ship of bones, me in a spaceship. She'll carry a handful of newly hatched nymphs in the pocket of her apron, the striped one she wore every day in the kitchen. How she'll giggle when a dozen hoppers gobble our waste and turn it into soil making frass the fertilizer in which she can grow her beloved geraniums. Note to self, bring seeds. She'll thrill when those green shoots sprout from regolith, the grainy mix of eroded rocks and minerals covering Mars surface, forgetting how her old fears once took root. Laughing at how frightened she used to be, she'll adopt a hopper she'll name Sam after her father, the socialist who never locked his car just in case someone needed to take whatever he'd left inside. She'll sit on a rock and let Sam crawl over her open palm, spitting juice. To each according to his needs, she'll remind me. 
She won't be nagging me to hang up my coat or telling me I'm too young to go steady. And the grasshoppers will keep laying eggs, jumping, pooping, dying, making more frass. Then we'll plant tomatoes, and when they're ripe, my mother will shout, God, I love those grasshoppers. As we bite into the flesh, let the juice and seeds run down our chins, wipe the runoff with the backs of our hands. Hi, this is Holly Harrison Klein. I'll be reading my piece, Multiverses. And since it's a piece written in two voices, uh, I've asked my husband to read with me. Multiverses. Listen, she says, perched on the arm of the couch, gesturing like a conspiracy theorist. There's a whole multiverse out there, countless versions of you and me living every possible life. Isn't it incredible? Listen, she says, eyes blazing with fear, masquerading as fury. There's a whole multiverse out there. I'll bet in more than half of them we have good health or good health care. Isn't this one trash? Listen, she says, voice filled with despair, pretending to be resignation. There's a whole multiverse out there, and I hope this is the worst one for us, so things are better for all the others. Isn't that a kind of hope? Listen, he says, wrapping the infinite cosmos around her like a blanket. There's a whole multiverse out there, every possible life for you and me, and I got to share this one with you. Isn't that beautiful? Rainbow Boy by Tara Driver. A 10-year-old boy came through the ER with two-thirds of his body burned. The burns ranged in severity. He'd have to remain on the burn unit for at least a couple of weeks and receive regimen and treatments, including debridement. Debridement is a cleaning process where dead and contaminated tissue is removed from the body via enzymes, blasts of water, or sharp medical instruments. It's agonizing and traumatic. The process is very wet and very smelly. Necrotizing flesh has a unique smell that's unforgettable. I receive a referral to work with this boy as soon as he's able. Our first session focuses on building trust. He is wheeled into the playroom by his nurse. Much of his body is covered in bandages, and he reminds me of the invisible man, minus the hat and trench coat. I show him around the playroom and do my best to help him feel comfortable. I show him how the toys and games and art supplies are organized. He is quiet, polite, and probably still in shock. His eyes are large and alert. He moves slowly and deliberately. What's left of his hair is red. I tell him we'll meet again in a few days. He is wheeled into the playroom again by a different nurse for our second session. Some of his bandages are off now, and I see his red and pink skin. It's shiny and smooth in some places, textured in others. When his nurse leaves, he looks into my eyes and commands me to draw a portrait of him. I feel panic well up and hope I haven't visibly flinched. I concentrate on keeping my face neutral while my heart drops and pings around in my gut. I calmly nod, inhale, exhale, and ask him to pick out the art medium he wants me to use. He chooses markers and paper. I wonder how to gently go about this, but there is nothing gentle about this. This boy is burned because he ran back into his burning house to save his baby sister. She didn't survive. I don't know if he didn't get to her in time or if she died later. I ask him, what colors do you want me to use for your skin? He breaks eye contact with me, looks down at the markers, and sets aside red, pink, yellow, green, blue, purple, and orange. I ask, where do I start? He hands me the yellow marker. Draw my feet. At the bottom of the 18 by 24 poster board, I draw feet. Now draw my legs. I draw legs. Now draw my body, draw my chest, draw my arms, draw my hands, draw my neck, now draw my face. In silence, we look at the outline of a generic human figure and I await his instructions. One breath, two breaths, three breaths, four breaths, five breaths. Color me like a rainbow. Using all of the chosen colors, I color rainbow stripes up and down the figure. The boy on the paper looks otherworldly and magical, bright, colorful, beautiful, bold. He says, this is Rainbow Boy. We stand side by side and admire the boy on the page. I feel a little lightheaded and attribute it to the intensity of the session. I notice my breathing is more labored as I have to make an effort to inhale. My vision intensifies, colors appear brighter and objects appear sharper like with a new pair of glasses. 
I nearly excuse myself, but I don't want to break the moment with him. The rainbow boy on the page winks at me. Nope. I shut my eyes tightly and open them. The rainbow boy on the page winks at me again. The colors on the page shimmer. It's barely perceptible, but I see them shimmer like sunlight sparkling on water. I turn my head and look to the boy next to me. I wonder if he's seeing anything unusual in his drawing. He's still admiring his drawing, and he is smiling. Out of my peripheral vision, I see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, pink, and purple in a straight rainbow line shoot off of the page and shine onto the real boy. The rainbow boy on the page and the boy standing next to me are connected by a rainbow prism. I take a step back and watch the scene head on. The prism of color, not translucent, but not completely opaque either, shoots into the real boy's chest right over his heart. His chest lights up, and I think I can see his little heart glowing and beating under his hospital gown. The rainbow light spreads its warm, colorful glow radially up through his neck to his head, over through his arms to his hands, through his torso and pelvis, down through his legs and feet. Beams of rainbow light shoot through the tips of his fingers and socked toes. He locks eyes with me, and his eyes are full of joy and wonder. I hold his gaze for as long as I can, and I finally have to blink as the light becomes so bright. I blink hard, and in the time it takes for me to open my eyes again, he is gone, vanished.